out of Small Beer Press. Um, and we also have a small selection of beers in the back um, that are inspired by the book, so please don't be shy. <laughs> Um, Abby May Otis is a writer, teaching artist, storyteller, and fire starter who grew up right here in Chapel Hill. She studied at the prestigious Michener Center for Writers in Austin, Texas, the Clarion West Writers Workshop, and she now teaches at Overland College in Ohio. You can find her stories in journals like Tin House, Stories for Barrel House, Tort, and Tor.com, and now on our front counter. Um, Abby loves people and art forms on the margins, and if it's anything like Alexander Chi says, which is the first novel or work is um, kind of like a manifesto for a writer. I think that's um, very much true with uh, Alien by Self Disaster. Um, what is happening on the fringes and um, uh, or perceived as the fringes has reverberations that can shake everything up. Um, so thank you for attending tonight. Um, your support means we can continue to bring people like Abby to the store um, and create our literary culture here. Um, so you can have your book signed after the talk um, and have a beer with Adam. Um, so thank you so much, and please help me welcome Adam B. Otis. This collection is funny because they're stories, so I've written them like over a long period of time, and so some of them I wrote back when I was in college, and they're like, they're like a decade old now, and I, I feel very far away from them, but some of them are much more recent. Um, and this one kind of comes in the middle of that time when I was living in DC and working in the public schools. Um, and it feels appropriate to read tonight because I have like former teachers in the audience and, and current teachers, just not of me. Um, and yes, I wrote it and I thought that it was very sad. And then it got put in the humor issue of a magazine. Oh. And, that's I went about. and so I was like, okay, I'm officially funny. <laughs> and so I always have to thank my comedic inspirations, the nonprofit industrial complex and the DC public school system. Um, I think all of the quotes from the vice principal in here are things that were actually said to me or to someone I knew while we were working there. Um, and yeah, I, I'll read, it's like pretty short and then we can talk later. You can ask me questions or we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. I would love to hear from you. How are you all doing? I haven't seen a lot of you in a long time. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This is called Teacher. What we were doing that week was subject verb agreement. I showed the students pictures of Grayson and Haley picking strawberries or flying a kite. If Grayson were talking, would he say, I flies the kite or I fly the kite? Thompson raised his hand. Miss X, Miss X, I got a question. What the red things? Duh, strawberries, idiot, said Alicia. And Thompson said he's not talking to her, big tits, and Alicia stabbed a pencil into the back of his hand. Miss X, Miss X, Miss X, yes, Nikai? Um, like, is there like a drug that like keeps you acting like you're on the drug even when you're not on it no more? Oh, that sounds like PCP, Nikai. Now, if Grayson were talking to Haley, would he say, you pick the strawberries or you pick the strawberries? I think that's what my dad's on, said Nakai. In the pictures, Grayson and Haley were always colored with brown skin for cultural sensitivity. 
The curriculum master plan indicated that it was time to distribute the mid-unit assessment, so I did. Devin put his head on his desk and moaned like an old bear. Devin, I need you to fill out this assessment so I can know if you're making adequate progress. My tooth hurt, he said and moaned again. Well, that's third person, Devin. What ending do you put on the fur? <laughs> my tooth hurt, because I don't go to the dentist, because my mom don't sign up for benefits with the clinic, because the clinic open hours when she has to drop my baby sister off at kidney college, and she goes once with my baby sister, and they say they don't let you bring children in the benefits office, so we don't go back. When they turned in their assessments, they got a hug from Ashton, our innovation and evaluation intern. Ashton had a spreadsheet and he recorded each child's name and the duration and intensity of the hug. The goal was to quantitatively determine whether hugs were a worthwhile motivational strategy. Nakai handed in his assessment with only one question bubbled in and grabbed Ashton around the waist. Five, six, counted Ashton. As a college student, Nakai, buddy, I gotta ask you to let go. Part of Ashton's internship contract stipulated that he begin all of his sentences with, as a college student. <laughs> Nakai didn't let go. Ashton peeled his arms away. As a college student, I can tell you, the scale doesn't go past six, Nakai. The scale stops at six. Next week, we would start verb tenses, which they sorely needed. It was time for my performance review with the vice principal. Your assessment results were lackluster, he said. It's been seven months since I liked myself, I told him. I don't think I know how to tell the truth anymore. What you need to do, he said, is create an environment more conducive to learning. Sometimes when I speak, I can't hear the words. All I hear is the sound of worms pushing up through wet earth. The vice principal frowned. There is nothing in our standard-based approach that covers the sound of worms. I mean, maybe no one actually said that. That's the only word. <laughs> he leaned forward in his plastic chair. Let me give you some <coughs> advice. If I were you, I would maximize instructional time and minimize misbehavior. He waited until I had written this down, and then he stood up and shut the door. On the back of the door was a poster that said, if you believe, you can achieve. That curriculum cost us a lot of money, he said. He was close enough that I could feel his breath on my face. We should discuss how you can provide us with adequate returns on our investment. When I got back to the classroom, I found the substitute sitting at my desk making origami boxes. The class had dogpiled Ashton. They were pulling his hair and jumping on his stomach and lying down on him. As a college student, he gasped out, I'm really not okay with this. He said he was gonna leave us, Alicia told me. He said he wasn't gonna be here next year. She wrapped her body around Ashton's ankles and tied his shoelaces together. I could barely see Ashton under them. His feet kicked futilely. I let out a whoop and leapt on him too. <laughs> the class cheered. Their bodies writhed all around me. We tore up Ashton's spreadsheets. I took his clipboard and cracked it in half over his head. Something is wrong here, Ashton yelled. Something is hideously wrong. I told him if he kept starting sentences like that, his stipend would be withheld. <laughs> Alicia was the only one who received an adequate on her assessment. I asked her to stay after class so I could give her a super job sticker. She looked at it so intently, I thought maybe she was then she said, it's hard to be convinced of the necessity of verb tenses when our situation exhibits so little possibility for change. I said, Ac education is the number one predictor of economic mobility. She picked at the sticker and whispered, when I'm born, I am poor. Today, I am poor. When I die, I am poor. When I was little, I told her I thought that people who desire to do good things would accomplish good things. I thought that the best way to rectify evil was to notify the authorities. I thought there was nothing you couldn't understand if you were willing to ask questions. I thought if you had a brother and walk up with a hard rep, people 
would be too scared of him to rape you, she said. I gave her another sticker. At this point, I said I don't scream, because I know if I started screaming, I would never stop. Devin's tooth was getting worse. When he spoke, gray, foamy sludge spilled over his lips. I told him to open his mouth so I could look at it. His mouth had become a huge, eroding cavern. His teeth were icebergs, collapsing into a dark sea. As I watched, more fell away and the abyss enlarged. I recoiled and went back to teaching poetry. Because I was on probation, I had to read from the pre-approved curriculum script to make sure I didn't teach anything wrong. The vice principal checked on me every half hour. There are four types of poetry. I read haiku, quatrain, acrostic, and limerick. Thompson raised his hand and he called, and I called on him. He grinned, I got a question, Miss X. I'm sorry, don't you think the class smells like ass? The class howled. That's not following the golden rule, Thompson. My bad, my bad. But it's true, right? Fuck off, Thompson, said Nikai. He was sitting in the back of the room and his voice was very small. Don't talk to me, said Thompson. I don't want nobody talking to me, you shit their pants. You are not showing respect to your peer, I told Thompson. I'm going to write you up. Why don't you write up the person who shit their pants, is what I'm wondering. Nikai stood up and flipped his desk over. The vice principal walked in. The class screeched like an aroused monster with many heads. This is highly unorthodox, shouted the vice principal. I said haiku is composed of three lines. The first line consists of five syllables. The second line consists of seven syllables. The third line consists of five syllables. Now let us look at this example poem about the snow goose. <laughs> I did not look at the vice principal. I looked only at the paper. If I looked up at the class, they would become a sea and drown me. The home test kit revealed two lines. I didn't believe it. I was sure there was a testing error. Maybe there had been some sort of irregularity in the test-taking environment. Maybe the proctor had been incompetent. I took another and another and another, and in the classroom I shattered my super teacher mug on the floor and said, I'm pregnant. Oh, baby! The class was thrilled. I called Godmother, yelled Mommy. Thompson yelled, don't worry, Miss X, I'll teach your baby to do the running man. It's gonna be tight. You don't understand. I can't bring a child into this world. They didn't understand. <clears throat> Everyday children flooded into the world around them. They were foam on a rising tide. I need to get rid of it. And that they understood. What my sister does is fall on her bicycle. You gotta drink bleach, Miss X. You gotta shove some papaya up in your business. Alicia dragged a chair to the front of the classroom. Jump off your desk, Miss X. Fall on this chair. It's the best way. The class clustered around me. I stood on my desk. I jumped and crashed down onto the chair. A tree of pain unfurled in my stomach and I sobbed as the class applauded. I climbed onto the desk again. Blood ran down my legs. My head was buzzing. It sounded like a million people were running toward me from very far away. I looked down at the children and saw their faces flecked with my blood. If the world were as I dreamt it, I told them, I would be 10 feet tall, waving a flaming sword. A million people were getting closer. I would lead a horde of righteous warriors howling down a green hill. The world was growing translucent. I would burn everything until you got what you deserved. Suddenly we heard a thump on the window. The million people had arrived. It was everyone who had ever died for no reason. Their bodies were decaying and falling apart. There was a clamor in the hallway. The dead people had gotten inside. I could hear the vice principal yelling, do you have a hall pass? Do you have a hall pass? His voice made the pain bloom again in my stomach. I couldn't breathe. His shoes clipped closer to my door. I gasped, there's no way out. Alicia stepped forward. You need to jump into Devin's mouth, she told me. 
Devin obligingly opened his mouth and I saw an endless black chasm. Some of the class ran to the windows and flung them open. Come in, they beckoned to the dead people, hurry up. I looked from Alicia to them and back again. The vice principal was almost here. Alicia said, you need to jump like you would jump from a burning building into a fireman's net. You need to jump into Devin's mouth, otherwise this is the end and the stories will all be rewritten and there will be no sound left to speak our names. The vice principal flung open the classroom door. I spent six weeks at the National Summer Academy for vice leaders, he shouted, and before that I was a very successful hedge fund manager, and let me tell you, there does not appear to be a lot of learning occurring here. His face shone with sweat. Dead people pressed close behind him. I jumped. The gulf of Devon's mouth yawned around me. I didn't land. The class jumped behind me, one by one. Devin jumped last. This way, he called to the dead people. Follow us. The light of the classroom shrank above us and vanished. The bottom was nowhere in sight. Black wind ribboned sweetly through our hair. The kids grabbed each other's hands the way they had been taught in kindergarten, and we flew through the darkness toward a new world, and the dead poured down all around us. Thank you so much. That was really fun to read to an audience and this audience. Yeah. Uh, are there questions? Should I hang out up here? Did it really happen? Can mingle? <laughs> yeah, that's it's a, this is a nonfiction. <laughs> to also like hang out and talk more informally and we can explore the refreshment selection. <laughs> David, how did it first feel show? when you heard that somebody wanted to publish your collection? Oh. It was really exciting. Um, should I be talking more into microphone? Yeah. How did it feel when someone wanted to publish my first collection? Um, I had sent it to them without an agent, like I had just sent it myself. Um, it's published by Small Beer Press, which is a small press from out of Northampton, um, by a, a husband and wife who do absolutely everything themselves, which is incredible to me. Um, and Kelly Link, who is one half of the pair who runs it, is, is also a writer who's like meant a lot to me for a long time. Um, so it, it felt like, like one of the few poems that I could imagine for this book because this book is very weird and they're very weird. Um, and, and also just because like I'm, I'm an unknown person like coming right out of grad school, big presses don't like to publish story collections first. They want you to have a big novel that they can sell a lot of. Um, so, so I'm really grateful for small presses out there who are willing to take chances on less marketable books. Um, and this for a long time I've been feeling like like oh that that publisher is the only home that I could imagine for this strange object. And so it, it was really exciting and it was also kind of like validating. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's what I that's what I thought. I'm glad you saw it too. Um, and yeah, and, and then I learned what a long, arduous process it is to go from like a manuscript that you sent it to, to a book that gets published and like all of the work. And I feel like that's kind of made, like slowed down my reactions to everything because mm -hmm. it, it like makes everything delayed and it just, um, it was exciting to like have the publication date come and get copies of the book but it also felt like, okay, I've been working on this. We've all been working on this for a long time, and I've been like feeling that excitement for a long time. And I'm ready to work on new things. You know? mm -hmm. so, yeah. New weird things. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So as someone who doesn't know you from a 
But um, I, I can't stop thinking about Devin's mouth. <laughs> For some reason, is there a particular significance for you, or is there, uh, does that represent Devin's mouth? Something in particular? Um, I had a student who, like, like people don't get good dental care a lot of the time. Well, I, I figured that was probably yeah, yeah. And I, I had a student who would just sit in the back of the class with his head down and not talk, and yeah. got into a lot of trouble in other classes because of that. It was because he had the cavities and was in pain all the time. Um, and then I wanted an exit out of the world. Out of the whole world, um, and I wanted it to be something that came through the children. Um, they're always called the class or students all the way through, except for that that final moment where she's looking at them, and then they like become children. And I had to like when I was working with the copy editor, I had to go back and be like, make sure the word children is not in there ever until the end. Um, and. Yeah, I feel like I had a couple different weird things happen. Now I don't remember what they were, and somehow I landed on that, and that felt like like both an inversion, going deeper into the thing, and also a, an exit or a, a way out. Um, and I actually, looking back at the story, I'm not sure that the teacher should go with them. I kind of wanted the kids to escape, um, because thinking about like my own position in relation to um, kids, I was working with like I didn't there, there's so much of a power disparity there and like the, the exit out was mostly something I wanted for them um, and I was talking to a friend once about that feeling with that story and she was like well why does the teacher go with them like why why can't they just go and she gets left behind um, and sometimes I think that that would be a like a better or more consistent ending for that uh, but I'm lazy and I don't edit things <laughs> and, and also maybe like I want that for myself on like an emotional level. Um, I want that escape available to people. And yeah, and I wanted that escape emotionally, but also I like gross things like going into someone's mouth and rotting away. So I worked on that level also. I thought it was fascinating that that Devin's mouth, this rotting thing, <laughs> it turns out to be sort of this escape and this, uh, you know, like the, the answer and the, the nurturing thing in a way, and also how the teacher um, seemed to identify with the, the students and was back and forth with them, and the administration was a menace, you know, mm -hmm. even more so than the dead people, the students. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so I, like, I'm really excited when I can like do things with words that are not physically possible and like like the size of a mouth changes really dramatically. Um, and I feel like there's there's like art forms where you would have to explain that more because you would be actually showing it. But when I'm writing something in a narrative, I can just say that it happens and you have to follow along and believe me. Um, and so that's like a thing that I'm I'm really interested in often is like dramatically changing the, the rules or the constraints of a world. Um, yeah, so that makes, makes it very visual, too. You know, I visualize a lot of these things, like, including everything. So I have to, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Do you have your students read your writing um, to, that you're teaching at, at Overwood? And whether you do or you don't, if they have read it,
doing that. Um, and and I have shown things. I, I was like working with a with one girl doing a private reading last year who was like really into really strange kind of surreal worlds. I wasn't like feeling a lot of support for that, and so so I gave her lots of things to read, including things that I was doing, um, because I feel like. I felt like seeing how people, how like I was in the middle of experimenting with things was useful there. Um, and yeah, it's such a diversity of reading experiences at Oberlin. Like some people have read all kinds of strange shit and are like really into, no, I, I can't think. Um, but like into contemporary experimental writing and some people have only read Harry Potter and Catcher in the Rye, um, and so so getting to introduce them to what people are thinking about currently and like trying out and how people are reacting to um, past movements and literature is like is very exciting. Yeah. Hi. Um, coming out of Cleary West, do you have any uh, kind of anxieties about genre? Like, would you rather be Shelved in the mainstream fiction section or the fantasy and science fiction section? I love debating about genre labels. Um, I feel like that could go on forever, and I like talking about it as much as I don't really care like what what people end up calling things. Um, I feel like labels are in part like a marketing tool and more important to um, advertisers and publishing companies and also bookstores who want to like put things in certain places and attract an audience because um, labels are also like a handle that people use to represent, to make a vast spectrum of writing like graspable and understandable. Um, I think of myself as a science fiction writer or a genre writer. Um, I feel like I come out of a of a tradition of, of like having my my reading experience, my understanding of what stories do, formed by reading a lot of science fiction and like golden age, new wave, like classic sci-fi, as well as new stuff. I think there's a lot of literary writers right now who are getting more into weird um, speculative fiction. Um, but I, like historically and to me, like genre has always been a refuge and a home for experimentation and um, trying out new weird things in these marginalized places where like no one's really paying attention, um, but people are, are doing amazing things and, and like innovating structure that then gets taken into the mainstream. Um, so I'm really happy being a part of that. But then I also like, like I don't feel like craft or uh, like the literary sense of a work is compromised by being classified as genre. And I feel like language and structure and characterization and like emotional realism are still like really important to me. Um, and I draw a lot of that, and I've learned a lot from reading literary fiction and poetry and nonfiction and memoir and like all kinds of things. Um, I think I want my books shelved like in, in the poetry section, ideally, because <laughs> I'm really jealous of poets. And I wish that I were a poet, but I'm not. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think like, like the boundaries of what is science fiction, speculative fiction, literary fiction. I could talk a lot about that also. It's like a fun, ongoing conversation. Um, so I don't want to be like, I'm tired of it. I want to escape it. Because I, I really like being in it, but I'm also, I don't feel that worried about it. Hi. Yeah. I was struck with how you worked with the interplay of humor and pain. Uh -huh. It felt like the pain was building. 
Mother told me that she had a question before this reading. <coughs> okay. And she's not asking it, but maybe she wants to. <laughs> and Mom. of that and also like the weird things people will do to like preserve that feeling of, of home or having an escape um, work their way into stories. Um, and then I also lived in DC for a long time and worked there and I think like place isn't isn't very prominent in the thing that I read um, but the way that people engage with place is forms a part of how that the community and the school operates. Um, and there's other stories where like like places in DC form all the names of the characters in one story so they like work their way in in little subtler like literary gimmick kind of ways, but yeah. Thanks for that question. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Bodies around in different ways and not sit in rows anymore. But, um, I, I, yeah, I hope we all get to hang out more. Thank you so much. Thank you guys again. Um, I was just going to say, uh, Abby will send your book um, if you guys want to mingle and we have them at the front counter. So thank you. Thank you.